1994, a torrent came hurtling out of the high Himalayas and down Bhutan's Po River, part of the largest river system in Bhutan. The water in it was the equivalent of 7,200 Olympic swimming pools. It set loose five million tons of boulders, timber, and mud, uprooted thousands of trees, which formed a massive log jam at a bend 60 miles down the river, threw thousands of fish onto the shore where villagers who hadn't been caught in the flood ran and threw them into baskets, and it killed 22 people. Bhutanese didn't realize it, but they'd been hurtled into the new era of climate volatility. What caused the flood was the melting of Himalayan glaciers as a result of warming temperatures. As the glaciers are retreating up the mountains, they are leaving behind troughs of soil and boulders that they pushed in front of them during the centuries when they were expanding. Then those troughs filled with glacial meltwater and formed lakes, in some cases quite big lakes. The trouble is, the moraines holding back the water in those lakes are quite unstable and can easily give way, causing what is now known in the scientific lingo as a glacial lake outburst flood, a GLOF. After the 1994 GLOF hit Bhutan, officials sent researchers up into the mountains and realized that more GLOFs were possible. Indeed, one lake seemed poised to burst at any time, and if it did burst, it would release three times as much water as the 1994 GLOF. This realization was the genesis of the Tortormi Mitigation Project, a plan to gradually release water harmlessly from the lake before it burst, causing devastation. The lake is at 14,500 feet, a 10 days hike from the nearest road. Helicopters aren't feasible for many reasons, among them that the vibrations could destabilize the lake's moraines, setting off the cataclysm the project was designed to prevent. So the project's planners designed a kind of public works project. Summer is the only time when the lake is even accessible, so for four summers, the project sent 300 workers up one of the world's hardest trekking trails to the lake where they used nothing more than hand tools to carve an alternate channel for the water. The workers were paid $10 a day, an amount several times what they could earn as day laborers in lower altitudes and enough to attract the workers in spite of the hardship. To reach the lake, they climbed the trail during the summer monsoon when the rain was nearly constant, so they were always wet and cold. They had to climb over a 17,000-foot pass and two 16,000-foot passes, which meant that they risked getting altitude sickness. Indeed, three workers died of altitude sickness in the four years of the project, and two others lost all their toes to frostbite. Over those 10 days of hiking, they each lost 15 or 20 pounds and didn't get the weight back until they came back down at the end of the summer. Meanwhile, herdsmen brought the project's gear up the mountain on horses and yaks. The first people to make the climb were the project's staff, which included its leader, Karma Teb, the Bhutanese government's only glaciologist, an engineer, a surveyor, a park ranger, a doctor and his assistant, and a llama. The llama's presence reassured many of the workers, some of whom were afraid that their presence would upset deities who lived around the lake. At the beginning of each summer, the Lama performed a ritual to ease this fear, and he performed group rituals throughout the summer on the workers' day off. 
He also treated the ailments of workers who preferred his ministrations over the doctors. The staff set up a campsite next to the beautiful village of Tanza, the highest altitude village in Bhutan. In Bhutanese Buddhism, phalluses are thought to provide protection, so Karmateb planted wooden phalluses on all four sides of the campsite. A scientist who trained at Nagoya University in Japan, he didn't believe in the protective capacity of the phalluses, but he respected the workers' beliefs and wanted to set them at ease. Once the workers reached the camp, each day they hiked another 80 minutes up to the lake where they spent the day. The lake area itself was gray, and aside from some hardy shrubs, practically lifeless. It was still mostly ice-filled, and with all the rubble that the glacier had ground up over the centuries, the lake looked like a moonscape. Yet hovering over the lake was the astonishing pure white vista of 24,000 foot high Table Mountain, whose beauty seemed to sanctify its surroundings. Despite the difficulty of the work, some of the laborers grew to love the place for its peacefulness and beauty. They spent each day standing in ice water up to their knees, moving boulders and preparing a channel for the water to flow through. Sometimes the boulders were so big that all of them tugged on it at once and they'd chant, Pull, friend, pull! There already was a small channel for water from the lake, which they greatly expanded. First they'd block half of the channel at the lip of the lake and allow the water to flow down the other half. They'd keep one side dry, remove the boulders, and prepare the bed with rocks. Then they'd release water down that side, and blocked water from flowing down the other side, and repeat the same process on the other side. Their hands and feet and lips all got chafed and sore, and injuries were frequent. Their clothing wasn't adequate to keep them warm, and at night many of them drank whiskey because it made them feel warmer. Some workers used Sundays to bathe in the ice-cold stream. Others thought it was so cold they preferred to stay dirty. The villagers sold them whiskey and food at prices many times more than what they would pay down the mountain. Village women also joined in the work and proved just as tough as the men. After four years of work, the project met its goal of lowering the lake's water volume by a third, but the lake is still likely to burst, and only when it does will the project's planners find out if the effort succeeded in reducing the power of the flood. Mm -hmm.